Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the We Are CCA podcast. On this episode, we talked to Dr. Alec Posen, uh, who is an emergency physician uh, working for the Connemaw Health System. Um, in this episode, we talk about all things, uh, you know, medicine. Uh, we talk about the process of becoming a doctor, sort of what takes place from the you know, high school graduation all the way to, you know, becoming a licensed physician. Uh, we talk about you know, why he chose emergency medicine and what were some of the things that attracted him to that particular um, area of focus. And we talk about, you know, some of the things that make some of the characteristics and qualities that make up a good uh, practicing physician. Um, we also talk about a lot of other things, you know, what students can do now, what programs are available, um, what can you do in high school to prepare you for a career as a physician. Um, so we talk about all those things, talk about a lot more, and we really had a great time, um, you know, talking with him. He was a great guest, and we look forward to sharing you sharing the conversation with you. So with that being said, here it is. Enjoy the podcast. So, I, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, a lot of our students who are interested in becoming a physician, you know, they're just kind of they don't know a lot about the process. They don't know a lot about the process of, you know, how you go from, you know, your undergraduate uh, studies to becoming a practicing physician. So if, could you kind of give us the layout of sort of how, or sort of the step-by-step -step process for how that all works? Yeah. So let me start by saying, I think this is an awesome topic and I was glad to hear that you guys are doing this because I was sitting in that, that seat myself. So when I was in high school, you know, even in middle school, I, I knew I wanted to become a doctor, but I had no idea how to get there. I knew what the end game was. Um, I had some idea of the steps in between, but nobody in my family was a physician. You know, I I didn't know anybody closely that was a physician and, you know, you can do so much by talking to your counselors and your advisors in college you know, they're going off secondhand information, but it's another thing to like get that information from somebody who's actually done it. So, so when I heard you guys were doing this, I was really excited because um, I, I knew what that feeling was like. So, um, you know, the step, the step by step is, you know, obviously you have, you have to graduate high school, you know, just starting with a brief overview, get into college, you're going to get a four year college degree after college, then you you know, we're getting into medical school, which medical school is another four year degree. And then after that, you go on to your, your residency training, which is the specialization with, within medicine. So at that point, you are a doctor, but now you have to pick what specialty. That residency training is anywhere from another three to another seven years, depending on what you decide to do. Uh, and then after you finish residency, that, that gets you into your fellowship, um, which not everybody does a fellowship. And we can touch base on, on that a little bit later as well. Um, and that can be another, you know, one to three or four years, depending on what you decide to do. So, you know, after high school, we're, we're talking at least another, um, you know, eight uh, years of, of school plus another three, you know, to possibly 10 years of training, just depending on what you do. Um, so, so it is a long road. So you have to understand that, that, um, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about doing that, you have to understand that this is a long process and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, and you have to be prepared for, you know, the time commitment, but also the monetary commitment as well. Can you talk about um, your own personal sort of genesis? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm from uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I went to Westmont Hilltop in Johnstown. Um, you know, when you're when you're in high school, and we talk about those high school years, it, it's real important to, you know, start getting a, a little bit of background in medicine. So look at wherever you live, look at your local hospitals, a lot of those hospitals have programs you can get involved with, even as a high school student. So when I was in high school, um, the, the local hospital here in Johnstown, Conova Memorial Medical Center, um, actually had a job shadowing program where even as a high school student, you could sign up and go to the hospital for a couple hours and follow a physician around. So you get to pick whatever specialty you know you wanted to do they would match you up with a physician and you got to go spend some time with them and kind of get a little idea of what it's like to be a doctor you know every every aspect of medicine is a little bit different but you kind of got that little bit of a daily feel of what it's like um, they also have a lot of volunteer programs. So reaching out to your hospital to see if they have volunteer programs is also a good way to, to get your foot in the door. So, you know, even if that's, you know, handing out newspapers in the hospital or pushing patients around um, from, you know, their room to a test or something, <laughs> anything like that is getting you some exposure to the medical field. You get to see what's going on around you and you kind of get a feel for the atmosphere. Um, and volunteering is also a, a great thing to add to your, your resume and your application, both for college uh, and for medical school. So things like that are very helpful. Now, one 
one thing I will warn that, uh, you know, with HIPAA laws and, and things tightening down, I've, I've noticed a lot of facilities are starting to really crack down on, on their job shadowing. Um, but certainly, no matter where you are, there's somebody in your area, you know, whether they're a private physician or if they're part of a, a big group or, or a hospital setting, somebody will, um, you know, let you follow them along, even if it's just for a little bit to, to kind of get a feeling of what that's like. Then kind of going from um, my undergraduate, I went to the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. Um, I, I decided to stay close to home. Uh, when you're looking at colleges, you know, it, 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 in, in the end, it really doesn't matter where, where you go. You can get into medical school attending any college that you want. There are certain colleges that, that tend to have a great track record of, of getting people into medical school, um, you know, just as far as the way they set up their programs and the assistance they offer. But, but really, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter. It's all about, you know, what you make of it and the work you put into it. Um, one reason why I chose to go to the um, Pitt Johnstown was because it was close to home for me, so I knew I could live at home. Um, and the cost, I knew, you know, what my end game was, and I knew how much money I was going to spend. So I felt if I could save some money in undergrad and maybe go somewhere that was a little bit cheaper, um, you know, that that would definitely help in the long run. And, and now that I'm uh, finally paying my loans back, I'm glad I made that decision. Um, you know, uh, compared to some of my classmates and some of my coworkers that maybe went to a little more expensive undergrad. Now, when you start undergrad, the, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pick a major. Um, it, and to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter what major you choose. And that's one thing, um, you know, some people get a little hung up on. Uh, first of all, you can't be a pre-medicine major. So you can't go into medical or into college and get a degree in pre-medicine. Um, that's just kind of a track that you're under that, um, you know, helps make sure you get the required courses done. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if you love music, if you love finance, if you love writing, um, it, it doesn't matter. You can major in anything you want. The biggest thing is that you just have to make sure you're getting the required coursework done. So if we, yeah, the easiest way to figure that out is, you know, you start looking at some of the different medical schools on their website, they all post what courses are required. The majority of them are science related courses. So that's why most people decide to be biology or chemistry or biochemistry majors, just because under those major umbrellas, uh, you'll get the required coursework completed. But if you want to be a finance major, you can do that. You just may have to, you know, do a little more intense coursework or, or throw a few extra science classes in there um, to make sure that you get that coursework completed. Now, during your time in college, it, it's real important to start amping up that um, shadowing time. So start spending more time in hospitals. So again, whether that's job shadowing, internships, volunteering, um, all of that stuff is real important when it comes time to apply to medical school. Um, some other things, uh, be involved in your community, your campus community, the community where you're living. So whether that's volunteering, clubs on campus, other groups on campus, that's all important. Um, but something I want to say about that is don't be involved just to sign up to put it on your, your paperwork. You, you really need to actually be involved because when it comes time for, for interviews, uh, you're going to get asked about those groups and, and, and those experiences. And if you just never did anything with it, you're not going to have any answers. So uh, it, it is really important to, to be involved um, in making sure you're actually um, you know, doing something with that group. Another thing that's real important in undergrad is research. So uh, a lot of things medical schools look like uh, look at when they're looking at the application process is, is how much research or what kind of research you've done. Uh, again, something that easily you can find on your campus and also in your community. Um, here in Johnstown, I, I um, uh, got lucky that there, we have a nice bioscience research company here in town that I got to spend a summer with um, after my sophomore year to, to do some research. Um, so it was a paid internship. So I got to make some money in the summer, but also got to do a project and get some college credit um, for it. So, so that's nice as well. Um, and then, um, you know, after that uh, is when you're going to start applying to medical school. So usually around your junior year of college that summer, you're going to take your MCATs, which is similar to the SATs to get into college. Um, you'll, you'll sit, you'll take those, uh, get your scores back that spring, that summer, and then you'll apply to medical school, usually the summer before your senior year of college, go through an interview process and then get into medical school. Um, I ended up going to the Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, so that's another thing we can touch base on a little bit is the different types of medical schools. Um, I ended up at their campus in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So I was in South Carolina for four years. Uh, the way medical schools uh, are set up and they're all set up the same. You have two years of uh, 
coursework where you're lecturing just like you are in high school and college. Somebody you know is teaching you. Uh, you're getting your two years of, of coursework done, and then years three and four, you're in the hospital working, uh, getting some hands-on experience. Then before you go uh, do your residency, um, I then chose to do my residency in my specialized training in emergency medicine. Um, emergency medicine is kind of a different one where some training programs are three years, some are four years. Uh, my training program is a three-year program. Um, so I actually came back to Johnstown to do my emergency medicine residency at Connemaw Hospital. Uh, after I finished my training, then I decided to stay on at the hospital uh, where I'm now an attending physician. So I, I you know, work as a full-time ER physician and also part of my duties there is I, I teach the residents. So I work with them on a daily basis, spend one day a week um, you know, teaching them, lecturing them on different aspects of emergency medicine. Um, and the way my um, schedule set up, I get to do some fun things as well. So I'm also the team physician for the Johnstown Tomahawks here in Johnstown. So I, uh, uh, athletics was a big part of my life. I played hockey at Pitt Johnstown. So um, to be able to come back and do that was something fun uh, for me. And then I, um, I also am the program director for the mentoring and medicine program, which I'm sure we'll talk about here in a little bit, because that's also a, a real key program um, that I feel would be helpful uh, for the students. So I know that was a lot quickly, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then we can kind of go through that uh, piece by piece. Yeah. I mean, I, I, a lot of times I, you know, it's when you talk to people who are physicians or people who it's like, uh, you know, boy, it just seems like a lot, it just seems like yeah. a lot to go through. I'm like, yeah, but if I, if I got somebody like cutting me open to like fix something in me, I want them to have to have gone yeah. through all of that. Like, I want to know that the training was hard and rigorous and they had to be like dedicated to do it. I don't want them to, you know, pick a, pick med medical school because it's easy. Like right. I want, I want them right. to have, have had it hard, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that, I think the biggest, the other question that we get a lot from students is at what point do you start? Uh, making, you know, sort of earning money. At what point do you go from undergrad to medical school to, you know, where you're doing fellowships and, and some of those other and residencies? When do you start earning money? Yeah, so that that is a great question. Um, so residency is when you start earning money. Um, you know, in medical school, you're, you're living off loans, basically. Um, and one thing I have to, you know, I, I constantly remind students of when they're taking out those loans is remember that that dollar you spend now is going to be cost you way more than a dollar when you have to pay it back with with interest and the way interest rates were at the time. Um, so, you know, yes, you can, you can take out, you know, they, they give you the opportunity to take out a good bit of money in loans. It's just going to cost you more in the future uh, mm -hmm. when you have to pay it all back. Uh, but in residency is when you start making money. It's, um, you know, usually nowhere near what you're going to be making as, as an attending physician. And once you finally finished your training, um, but you are making money. So at that point, you get to start paying back some of your loans. You know, you have money to live off of. I mean, it, it is a com comfortable living, but, you know, at the same time, when you're trying to pay back hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, um, you know, you're still living on, on a pretty tight budget. If you decide to do a fellowship, you make a little bit more money, still not, you know, what you're making when you're completely done with the process, but you are making a little bit more. Um, you know, one, one thing we, we didn't really touch base on, and that's, um, you know, military medicine. So one option for people is um, you don't, you can go to any undergrad you'd like. And then if you're in medical school, and you decide you, you want some help paying for all of that, you can join the military, the military will, will pay for your medical school, they'll give you a living stipend, um, eat, you know, food, things like that. Uh, they'll cover. Um, but then when you're done with medical school, you have to do your training in the military that you tend to make a little bit less working in the military uh, from a medical standpoint, um, but your schooling was free. You're not paying back loans, which, which is a benefit. How, how, so how old were you when you got your, when you got the first check, how old were you? So um, I was 29 um, and that's going straight through. So that's pretty typical. So I went okay. straight from high school, straight through college, straight to medical school, and straight through residency. So in a three-year residency, I, I was 29 when I graduated, which, which is, you know, like I said, going straight through the process, not taking any time off. That's actually becoming kind of untraditional um, in this day and age. A lot of my medical school classmates uh, were several years older than me. And even my training, you know, when I, when I did my residency program, a lot of my classmates were several, several years older because they had other careers and then decided to go back to become a doctor or took some time off or got a master's degree in between. Um, so it, it's, 
it's actually not as common these, you know, in today's day and age to go straight through. A lot of people are taking some time off to do something else. Um, so, you know, you have to understand though, when you get done with your, your training and you do all that other training, you, you, you're, you're 10 years older than some of your friends that started working right out of high school or, or college, um, mm. you know, making money for years. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, you know, it's good to, you know, we need to tell our students the truth, right? So, Absolutely. I mean, that's the, re- and sometimes, you know, if you really want to become a doctor, that, that is not, you know, that's a, that's an understood sacrifice. Like, you know, that that's what the situation is, you know, that's the reality of the, of what you're sort of getting yourself into, but, you know, to have the, that information now so that you can make an informed decision about it uh, to s- sort of see if, if it's worth it to you, then, you know, the, the more information you have, the better. So I, I, you know, it, it helps our students and it helps, you know, any student that is interested in becoming a physician sort of understand that that's the reality of it. Absolutely. And I know like with student loans being so expensive right now, there's a, a lot of students who, you know, are trying to figure out ways to not have any student loans, but still get through, you know, college. And I'm like, and maybe in your undergraduate, that could probably work. You could probably have a full-time job and do school at the same time, kind of move that around. Is that realistic in med school? You know, it, it, it's tough. I, I think out of my class of maybe 180 students, there were maybe two people that had a job on the side to try to pay for that. It's because it is, it, it's tough. Now, um, medical schools are, are each a little bit different. Uh, the one I went to was you had, like we had required attendance. So every day I had to be in class sitting in front of, you know, a professor who was lecturing us. Um, some schools don't have required attendance. Some actually have uh, in, like independent study where you just learn it on your own time. So, you know, going down one of those tracks, you may have a little bit more time on your hands if you can, you know, plan your time well and you don't need as much time, maybe uh, you might be able to, to have a job on the side and, and earn a little extra money. But for the majority of people, no, you're, you're going to medical school is going to be your full time job, um, which stinks because, right, you don't have any uh, other time to, to earn money. Or if you do have some time off, most people don't want to be working. They want to be relaxing for that for those few minutes. Right. Because I imagine or studying or studying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I'm sure the med school classes are probably like a nine to five type structure. Yeah. yeah. For the most part, we were nine to five, um, you know, Monday through Friday. Uh, and then on the weekends, you were studying for the test uh, that was coming up on Monday. So, you know, not a lot of free time. And then, but then once you hit years three and four, when you're in the hospital, you do get a little bit more time, which is nice. Mm-hmm. No, well, I, I, I'm sorry. I, uh, I think we need to, we need to know why emergency medicine, like why did, why was emergency medicine what you chose to, to sort of specialize in? Good. So that's a good question. So kind of, you know, in high school, when I was dead set on becoming a doctor, I was always interested in anesthesiology. I don't know where that came from, how that <laughs> happened. Um, I just became interested in anesthesia. I don't know if it was because I, I, I broke my wrist and had to have surgery in, in, in high school um, after a, a, an accident playing hockey. Um, and I don't know if that was where my love of anesthesia came from. And then I started shadowing anesthesiologists and, and realized for me, that was just a little boring. Um, you know, a lot of the times it's, it's the nurse anesthetist that are doing, uh, you know, they're sitting with the patient throughout the entire procedure and the anesthesiologist is just coming in and out of the case. Um, so to me, I wanted something a little more exciting, um, in college, I got to participate in the mentoring and medicine program at Kahnema. And that's kind of where my love of emergency medicine came from. You know, I, I, I was drawn to that aspect of, you never know what's coming through the door next. Um, you have no idea. It could be, you know, calm one minute. And then the next minute, you know, there's a a massive car accident and you're getting multiple patients. Um, I, I like the fact that I get to treat, you know, patients who are newborns that were, you know, born within the last several days. And I get to take care of people who are, you know, in their 100s, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, and then everybody in between. So I get to see a little bit of everything. Um, You know, that joke that like master, you know, jack of all trades, but master of none kind of in the Mm -hmm. ER, because we kind of have to know a little bit about every specialty, because we see patients from every specialty, um, you know, that come through, and we have to talk with every specialist in the hospital. Um, you know, so we do have to know a little bit about everything. So I get to kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and we also get to do a lot of procedures too, which is nice. So, you know, not as much as a surgeon gets to do, but at the same time, we do get a lot of, of procedures, uh, in the emergency department, which is what I was drawn to. 
Another thing that's making emergency medicine a lot more popular is just kind of the lifestyle of it. So, um, you know, you might only be working, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 shifts a month. So the other half of the month you get to have off. Now, whether you want to spend that picking up more shifts, that's a possibility, or you just like your time off and you want to travel or spend it with family and friends, that's nice. One of the big downfalls is, you know, you're working nights and days and, and holidays. So, um, you know, you're in the hospital at all hours of the days and you constantly are flipping from working a night shift to a day shift and, and back and forth. So that is one of the downfalls of it. But, um, you know, that doesn't bother me. And, and that was something that definitely drew me to emergency medicine was that lifestyle. Was there like a moment, like a key moment where you're like, yep, emergency medicine's for me? Like did, did you had a patient come in and you had an experience or was it just something that kind of grew over time? Yeah, I think it did kind of grow over time. I, I think when I, when I spent that week, um, when I did the mentoring and medicine program, um, it was during the big uh, Thunder in the Valley motorcycle rally that's always held um, in Johnstown. And uh, tend, the ER tends to be a little busier that week. And, um, you know, so I, I got to see some, some pretty crazy things. Um, and, and just watching those physicians interact with their patients and, you know, watching someone who to me was, you know, on death's doorstep and, and watching that physician save their life was just something that really uh, drew me to it. Um, and, you know, not only that, and now that I get to practice in my hometown is, is special to me because, you know, I get to take care of my, my friends, my family, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, which is nice. And, uh, you know, another aspect of it that I enjoy. Is there, is that, is that kind of a double-edged sword though? that you know practicing in your own community where you know if you you know you may have a friend or somebody come in that you know is 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 in bad shape is that an idea is that something that weighs on you a little bit yeah it is so that's you know something and i've had that happen i've i've had friends and family come in that are you know they're they're in a rough spot you know nobody comes into the er on a good day you see people Mm -hmm. in their worst days um you know which which, which is, you know, we're understanding of, and I'm used to that. That's, that's my daily life. Um, but you know, there are times it's tough that when you, you, know, you see people like that and, um, you, you know, you don't want to see anything bad happen to anybody, but especially, you know, if it's your mother, your grandmother, you, you know, you're, you, it, it, it adds a, an extra level to it. And the other thing too, is you always have eyes on you. Um, my parents are both bankers, so they're out in the community a lot. So I, I hear it frequently, you know, one of their uh, customers will come tell them that, Hey, I saw your son in the ER and they'll give them a, a report card of how I did. So, you know, I, I hear about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> how is that work-life balance? Um, I mean, you know, you mentioned it a little bit, but like, you know, I, I know sometimes people choose to go like physician assistant or nurse practitioner because they feel like there's a little bit more work-life balance. How is that work-life balance for like an ER doc? Yeah. You know, one thing that's nice is like, I, I know exactly what time my shift starts and what time my shift ends. So yes, there's some times where I, you know, I may get stuck a, a little bit late, but I'm never on call. So, you know, I don't have to worry about carrying a pager when I'm home, I'm off. So I know that I don't have to worry about getting called in the middle of the night. If I'm going to an event with my children, um, I don't have to worry about that getting interrupted. I know that I'm off. Um, so, so that is something that's nice. Um, it is something my, my children have to understand though, that sometimes during the day I need to sleep because I work at night, um, or that, you know, I might miss Christmas, uh, because I have to work in the ER. So that's, that's something that even though they're young, they understand that, you know, that's part of my job, um, and something I have to do, but you know, it, it does. That's one thing that is sometimes, you know, frustrating when you do have to miss those events in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. What makes a good ER physician? You know, it's somebody who can, you know, function under the pressure and under the stress. Um, You know, somebody comes in the door, you don't always have time to, you know, look, look through their chart and see why they were here before or get some information because they might not even be able to talk to you. So you might have somebody who's, you know, completely uh, unresponsive and you have no idea what their history is. Um, what could possibly be going on? And if nobody's with them, you know, you, you have to be able to function in those situations. So it, it is somebody who can function under the pressure. You have to be willing to, um, you know, move quickly uh, because, it, you know, like for instance, our ER has um, over, over 30, uh, well, over 40 beds. Um, so, you know, you're taking care of an ER full of people. So you have to, you know, you can't just focus on one patient. You have to be aware of what's going on around you. Um so, you know, those, those are some big things with emergency medicine. Have you ever been in a situation where, you know, you had like maybe two high priority cases come in at the same time and you had to sort of make a decision about which, which one, you know, got the, the immediate attention and which one, like, how do you, you know, how do you rationalize that or sort of how do you deal with that dilemma? 
Yeah, it is. And, you know, that that happens a lot where you get multiple critical patients at once. Um, you know, one thing that's nice about our facility is that during the day, there's usually two or three physicians on, but at night, like, you know, once you start hitting like the, the two, 3 a.m. time frame, there's only just, you know, you're, you're the only physician covering the whole emergency department. Now we have residents with us where I'm at. So it is something you can kind of delineate where the resident can go, you know, deal with one patient while you're taking care of another patient. Um, but yeah, you just have to look at, you know, who's the most critical, get them stabilized and, and, and move to the next one or, or bounce back and forth. Um, you know, in emergency medicine, uh, especially here at, at Conama, I'm lucky that I work with a lot of great nurses and a lot of great staff. So, you know, everybody knows, uh, you know, what needs to be done to quickly stabilize a patient, um, you know, uh, until the physician gets in the room or while the physician is dealing with somebody else. Um, you know, every, everybody uh, has great teamwork um, and every, everybody knows that aspect. I, you know, I hate to like sort of be a Debbie Downer, but like, obviously not every case that comes in has a positive outcome. Um, how, how do you process that? Like, how does that, how does that affect you? How do you process it? How do you sort of, how do you sort of um, kind of internalize it and, and, you know, move on to the next case? Like, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, no, that's, you're absolutely correct. You know, not, not, you know, you, you, unfortunately there, there are people that, that pass away. There are people that don't make it. There's people you have to give bad news to, you know, people can come in thinking they might have just a simple thing and you end up finding, you know, like cancer or something like that. And you have to mm-hmm. sit down and, and now tell them that, Hey, that wasn't just a simple headache you were having. It, it turns out you have a brain tumor or, you know, or cancer or something like that. So th- those conversations are tough and it's something that, you know, with time. And that's what I try to tell a lot of our, our students, like, listen, when, when physicians are talking to these families and having those t- tough conversations and see how they do it, because, you know, it's definitely something that's not easy. Uh, and you have to be careful because you, you have to portray that in a matter that people understand. You can't be using fancy terms or medical mm-hmm. terms. You just have to flat out say it and, you know, don't beat around the bush. Um, and, and to get back to, you know, those, those, tough situations, you know, there are times you, sometimes you have to walk out of the room and, and take a deep breath. Um, You know, I can remember the first time I saw a patient pass away and it wasn't that it it, it was tough, Um, you know, and uh, a lot of times we have like a debriefing after those situations where we'll, the whole team, you know, the nurses, the techs, the residents, the doctors, uh, everybody kind of gets together in a quick little huddle. Um, you know, we, we talk about the situation um, and then, you know, there, there is help for people that maybe need a little more help. Um, you know, it, it was, um, you know, something that especially now, like after I've had kids, when I, you know, when I take care of a sick child or a dying child, like, you know, it really hits you hard. Um, you know, it, it always hit me hard, but then especially when I have children that age, it kind of like took it to another level for me. And it, it is something that's, that's tough to deal with sometimes, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have to remember, you know, what my job is and I, I have to do my best, um, you know, to, to treat each and every one of those patients. Yeah. I think probably training, you know, confidence in your training, confidence in your abilities and sort of having a, having the, uh, a solid foundation of, you know, you did everything you could within, you know, within the, the, the scope of your capabilities. And, and if you did the best you could, you did the best you could. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, and again, I hate, I hate to be sort of the Debbie Downer of the conversation, but I think it's, and again, it's a reality. If students want to pursue emergency medicine, you know, there's a reality that comes along with it. So, um, and it's good to hear that from somebody who's been through the experience. So. I would also say it's also that there's also, I mean, plenty of positive moments too in the emergency department. You know, the person who you thought was on death's door who then boom, you know, their heart restarts and we're good again, you know, right. or that you are able to deliver good news. You know, there, there definitely mm-hmm. are some of those moments too, that you can kind of hold on to, to make it through that day. Yeah. The, you know, there, there are those moments, you know, there's times where, you know, we, uh, we birth a baby. That's not something that usually happens in the <laughs> ER, but it happens. Sometimes you're running out to the parking lot at 2 AM cause they didn't make it, you know, yep. uh, in, in time. So, you know, moments like that, or like you said, you know, somebody's having a rough day and you, you know, you, you fix their issue or even sometimes just talking to one of us, puts some people at ease, um, you know, just having their questions answered a, a lot of times um, or their concerns, um, you know, addressed helps people a lot. So there, there are those good times, um, you know, and, and those are definitely something that, that we hold on to and, and we appreciate. Have you experienced any of those like small miracle moments? 
Yeah, we've had um, I did a couple times we've, uh, you know, helped deliver a baby in, in the parking lot or, um, you know, recently I had a patient who's kind of been dealing with something for an extended period of time, couldn't get the answers that they, that they wanted and kept having the, these problems. And, you know, we were able to figure the problem out and, and help them. And they were very thankful to myself and the resident, um, you know, and that's just something that, that makes you smile that, you know, hey, we, you know, we were able to help her out, get some answers. Um, and now that person can get on the road to the recovery now that we found the problem. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I would really like to talk, you were talking about the a mentoring program. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, really uh, would love to finish, finish this conversation off with just, just sort of informing students about what they can and can't do, what they can do now to start preparing for a career in medicine as a physician. Yeah, so this mentoring program is pretty cool. Um, it's one of the only programs like it actually in the entire country, and it's crazy we have it right here in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. So um, Dr. Schrader um, was an orthopedic surgeon here in town, and him and his wife started this program um, about 18 years ago. And the reason they started it, because their oldest child said, hey, I want to be a doctor. And they were like, well, how do you know you want to be a doctor? You know what? What have you done to this point that, you know, has has shown or has led you experience that? And how do you know this is really what you want to do? Um, so they, they kind of created this program to give that experience. So this program is built for for college students. Um, we allow students to apply after their sophomore year of college, uh, but preference is given to the upperclassmen. So the juniors and seniors. It's a 10 week summer program um, where you get to spend the full 10 weeks in the hospital and you get to experience pretty much every specialty there is. So we split the students up, you get to spend, you know, maybe a week or a half a week with, you know, emergency medicine or in the operating room with general surgery or neurosurgery um, or out in the clinic, like with family practice. So we allow you to get all of those experiences. Uh, it's a paid internship, which is nice. Most shadowing experiences aren't paid, but our hospital, um, you know, understands the importance of something like this. So Conamaw graciously funds this program to give the students a stipend. Um, another part of the program is that during um, those, those 10 weeks, every week we have some sort of discussion. So we get together once a week and have a discussion about different topics in medicine, such as how do I uh, write my personal statement? What is a personal statement? How do I interview? So just skills like that. Uh, then we talk about things such as like women in medicine and how that's changed, um, you know, uh, over uh, the years. Um, relationships in medicine, like how, how do I, you know, hold on to a relationship or what are some of the things I need to be aware of, you know, in my relationship as I go through this process. So we talk about a lot of good um, topics and help the students. Um, we also, the students get to do some hands-on learning in the simulation lab at the hospital. Um, we even take them to tour some, some medical schools. Um, to kind of get their foot in the door and see what medical school is like. So it's, it's, it's a pretty awesome experience. Um, I got to do that when, when I was an undergrad. Um, and then when I finished my training, um, I actually got to take the program over when, when Dr. Schrader retired. Um, now, the, the program specifically for students who want to be a physician, um, but at the same time, there are people who do the program and then decide, you know, they don't want to, either they don't want to be a physician or they don't want to go into medicine at all. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Schrader's son, who he started the program for, decided not to go into medicine at all after doing the program. So it did serve its purpose because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you what you don't want to do is you don't want to get to the end of, of college or even start going through medical school and realize this isn't what you want to do because now you've wasted all that time and money and now you got to go figure out something else. So um, it, it did serve its purpose in that case. Um, but we do boast about an 80% uh, acceptance rate in, into medical school, which is good for the student, students who participate. Um, now it is only open to students who are in the, the area that's kind of served by Conema Hospital. So that's like the um, Cambria, Somerset, Bedford counties, parts of like Blair and Indiana and Westmoreland counties as well. So I know you guys have a lot of students from those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, you know, anybody that, that's, that's in those regions, when you get to that point after your sophomore or junior year, um, certainly reach out to us um, and let us know you're interested in, and we'll get you through the application process. Um, it, it is competitive and we do only accept 10 students per year, but if it's something you, you know, you get chosen to do it, it's a great program. And I owe a lot of my success in reaching my goals to that program, because again, I had no idea where I was headed. Um, you know, and, and that the mentoring and medicine program really helped me out. That's truly fantastic. Um, I wish everybody that was everywhere across the state here. Um, if you don't live in that region, though, what recommendations would you have for students interested in kind of exploring further? 
Yeah. So a lot of hospitals, they, they'll have, you know, maybe somewhat uh, similar or, you know, just maybe not as intense programs. So certainly reach out to your local hospitals and, uh, you know, the, the, the HR departments will kind of tell you what they have available, you know, whether it's something paid or unpaid um, or if it's a volunteer thing, any experience helps. And, and, and you know, it, even if it's not a hospital setting, that's, that's the easier thing. They'll kind of have more opportunities for you, even just reaching out to your, your local primary care doctor you see or your pediatrician, just talking to them. Because if they, even if they don't allow you to come into their office, that they should allow, you know, know someone that does allow you to um, shadow them. Because that's one thing medical schools want to see is, hey, have you, have you actually spent some time looking into this? Um, to know this is what you want, because we don't want to get you in and take a seat and then have you leave after a couple of weeks because you decided this isn't for you. So, or, or, and one of the things you also talked about early on was uh, students in high school um, and volunteering, uh, getting involved in volunteer programs, even if it's just, you know, working in patient transport. Um, is it, do you feel like the value of that, those experiences are sort of just being in the environment or the actual um, the actual tasks themselves that students were able to sort of have some of that direct patient care experience. Yeah, you know, it, it, it is a little bit of both. Um, you know, it, just being in that environment already puts you a step ahead because I can tell you I went to medical school with some people that were never in the environment at all. So they never got that experience. They, 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 they didn't understand, you know, they had never even stepped a foot in that environment. So having that, you know, really sets you ahead. Um, but even just, you know, you have to work your way up. I, you know, we, we tell the, you know, the, the students when they start the mentoring medicine program, like, look, you know, the, the environmental service workers know more than you do. So you ask, you know, you learn from everybody in the hospital, you, you ask everybody questions and you learn, um, because you, you can learn something from everyone. So, you know, even if it is, if, you know, if you are in, you know, mopping floors or patient transport or handing out newspapers, I guarantee that will benefit you. Um, another thing a lot of high schoolers look into is just like taking a medic class. So, you know, becoming a, an, an EMT, um, is something that you can do in your, in your spare time, um, in, in just, you know, you know, help out any way you can, but you'll, it'll also get you some exposure um, to, to, to living that life of medicine. And it's something you can kind of do on the side, you know, in college uh, and even in high school. Uh, Ian, do you have any final questions? Say, yeah, final question here. Are there any skills that you would say would be like essential to start working on now? You know, the big thing is, is obviously your, your people skills, no matter what field of medicine you go into, you know, you're going to have to be able to talk to people, interact with people, um, not only colleagues, obviously, but patients, even if you go into, you know, something with less patient interaction, such as like a pathology or radiology, where you're maybe not interacting with patients as much, um, you know, you're still going to need those skills to work with your coworkers. So it's real important in high school um, to be thinking about that. And, and one other thing I think that's real important is, is have a backup plan because I, you know, it's, it's very competitive. And after COVID, it's gotten even more competitive. There's more medical schools opening up. So there's more seats available, um, but there's more people applying. So things are getting more competitive. So make sure you do have a backup plan. And that's kind of one thing. And when I, I touched on, you can be any major you want to be. You know, one thing I always think about is, well, if I didn't get into medical school, what was I going to do with my biology degree? You know, where was that going to take me? And I think about that all the time. Like, where was I going to go with that? What was I going to do? Um, so that's one thing I, I, I thought about, like, oh, I wish I would have maybe got a degree in, in finance or something like that so that I had a backup. Um, but also, I think finance would have been very important for, you know, for helping me in, in, you know, say I decided to open my own practice or do something like that. I think that would have been be very beneficial. So yeah. definitely look at your options when you're choosing a major um, and understand that, you know, what's your backup plan in case one, you don't get in or two, in case you get partway through college and you decide this isn't what I want to do. You know, you need to have that plan of, of OK, well, what's what's my backup plan so that you have something to fall back on. I think that's an important, a really great and important point for students to sort of have that, like, hey, you know, if it doesn't work out or if you don't get into medical school, you still got a degree. You know, you still have an undergraduate degree and you want to make sure that that degree prepares you for a career in something and something that you would enjoy and have an interest in pursuing. So um, I, I never I didn't really think about, pers you know, you wouldn't think about getting a degree in finance and then going to med school. <laughs> but, you, you know, the the the. the the common association is biochem, chem, or biology. Those are the, the right. ones that, you, you know, you do those, one of those three. And um, I didn't, you know, I had no idea. You could just 
you know, it could be psychology, it could be whatever you wanted it to be, um, but make sure that you have um, an avenue for employment if the medical school uh, thing doesn't work out or doesn't pan out for yeah, you. Yeah, and, and one other thing too, um, that, you know, we talk about majors and things like that in, in colleges, you know, a lot of high schools will give you opportunities to get some college credit while you're in high school, um, which is fine. You just have to be careful that it's usually those science credits, though, won't, won't count. So, you know, okay. it's fine to get like English and history and then those kind of elective and selective courses, um, you know, in, in general education credits, that's fine. Um, but you don't want to be doing that for like your chemistry and your biology. Uh, medical schools want to see that you actually took those and, and got the A and the B while you're in a college setting. Um, so I, I certainly got a lot of college credits while I was in high school. Um, but, you know, at least I had the, the forewarning to, to not not waste my time doing it for the, those core classes. Um, because otherwise you're just going to have to retake them when you're in college. Sure. That's a really good point. So maybe our students, you know, who want to do college in high school can take um, the personal finance course. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that is, is completely perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we really appreciate the time today um, that, you know, this was a big one for us as far as just the number of students interested and the information that you could provide that we can't. <laughs> so you filled in a ton of the blanks today for us. We really appreciate that. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we might have to have you back if you're willing for maybe a part two follow up. So, yeah, no, absolutely. If there's any specific questions, you know, let me know. I'm more than happy to answer them and I'm more than happy to come back. Uh, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, like I said, I know this is something that I would have loved to have when I was in high school. So uh, anytime I can help, I'm more than happy to help out. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. You're yeah. welcome. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, we had a great time recording this episode. We had a great time uh, talking with Dr. Posen about all things uh, careers in medicine. Um, if you guys have any questions um, about anything that you heard on the episode today, please feel free to send those questions for Dr. Posen to internships at ccaeducate.me. We'll make sure to send those on to him to get a response. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the episode today. I hope you learned a lot. I know that we did. Look forward to uh, seeing you at the next episode. And remember that we are CCA.